up next on The Reveal. She had a really poor grade on her midterm, which I think is a direct reflection upon how she was taught. School courses taught by underqualified teachers in Georgia classrooms. For um, the school to stick us with that teacher, it was kind of a setback for all of us. Matt. Dyslexic kids have a lot of word finding issues. And the state is failing to help students with special needs. It's hurting. Is the quality of your child's education at risk? It's a national problem. It's a Georgia problem. What are you guys doing about it? <laughs> You've seen the gruesome pictures of puppy mills in Georgia. These dogs were murdering each other and eating each other. Why isn't more being done to protect these animals? I've really lost a lot of confidence in the system. From the Midtown Studios in Atlanta, the reveal begins now with investigators Faith Abube and Brendan Keith. Welcome to The Reveal, an investigative show making an impact. For the first time, the Georgia Department of Education released records identifying how often classes are taught by teachers without certification in the subject matter they're actually teaching. A Reveal investigation uncovered it impacts poor and communities of color the most. Education advocates say the results reveal institutional discrimination. <laughs> Under the lights in Gwinnett County, 15-year-old Dakota Vaughn warms up for her softball game. While the teenager focuses on the scoreboard in the field, her mom Toyasha makes sure she's focused on more important numbers at home. So tell me your high and low for today. Her daughter's next report card. My grade on the interim was a 47. Ouch. Big ouch. Earlier this year, Dakota's freshman geometry class at Discovery High School was taught by someone who did not have a yeah, teaching it, certification in life. math while her teacher was on medical leave for weeks. She had a really poor grade on her midterm, which I think is a direct reflection upon how she was taught. For um, the school to stick us with that teacher, it was kind of a setback for all of us because we weren't able to learn what we needed to know. According to records obtained from the Georgia Department of Education, more than a quarter of all courses taught at Discovery last year were led by instructors teaching out of their field. It's worse in math classes, more than a third taught by underqualified teachers. This is my study guide. It's not just a problem impacting Dakota's school. A reveal analysis of hundreds of schools across Georgia show a pattern to the problem. Courses taught by underqualified teachers often impacting the poor in communities of color. Is it fair to blame a child for their lack of performance when they weren't provided with the appropriate tools to perform? No, it's not. 30 miles away in DeKalb County, the inequity is even more clear. At Columbia Middle School, 43% of its courses were taught by teachers without proper certification last year. Zoe Bishop attended Columbia Middle School last year. Uh -huh. Troya is her mother and a former middle school teacher. It is warm and it is friendly, but like a lot of other areas in Atlanta, we're a direct reflection of what's going on in the United States, and we have a lot of challenges. Those challenges get worse when you're poor. Consider this comparison. At Columbia Middle, 65% of all students are so poor they qualify for free lunch. Across town in the same district is Champion Middle in a more affluent neighborhood. Nearly all of its teachers are certified in their subject areas. The disparities are most striking in its STEM classes. At Champion, not one of its science courses was taught by an underqualified teacher. At Columbia Middle, it's more than half. There's North Cab and there's South Cab. And Columbia Middle School is in South DeKalb and has a South DeKalb reputation of, you know, you, you won't get the resources, you won't get the funding. In North DeKalb, you'll get resources, or would you go to South DeKalb where you got to struggle as a teacher to really get what you need for your students? So all of those things go through, go through a person's mind when they're making a decision about where they want to teach. Race and class, that's where it always ends. Marilyn Tillman is the executive director of the Gwinnett Parent Coalition to dismantle the school to prison pipeline. Is this a form of discrimination? Absolutely, 
Absolutely. We fund our values, right? And so if we really are this nation that believes in, in this state that is so grounded in the least of these, why are the least of these still the least? <laughs> what are we doing to bring that up? We're not. How do you respond to that? Um, teachers have free will about where they teach. And when we hire someone, we hire them for a specific school. Cindy Saxon is an associate superintendent as, um, at the Georgia Department of Education. Um, high poverty schools are sometimes very difficult to teach in. And the reason for that is because parents are sometimes working two and three jobs. And they're engaged with their children, don't get me wrong. They're engaged with their children and they support their children at home, but they're not as likely to be involved in the school community. And some teachers look for that. They want that. Saxon says the state once offered pay incentives to teach at challenging schools, but it didn't work. Few teachers applied. Schools like Columbia Middle get additional federal funding, but advocates believe it's not enough to compel more qualified teachers to leave better performing schools like Champion. Do you really believe that these two schools are offering the same quality in education? I believe it depends on the credentials that those teachers that are considered out of field bring to the table. And I also believe that the schools and the districts know their personnel and they know their children better than I could possibly ever know them. A public education system some believe isn't on the same playing field for those who need help the most. There's always been racial injustice within our communities, and so I can't expect it to be any different in our school system. Next on The Reveal. She's still failing. Somebody should be working with her. Somebody should be providing those accommodations to her. Georgia schools not equipped to teach mm -hmm. students with special needs. It's a national problem, it's a Georgia problem. What are you guys doing about it? A reveal investigation uncovered the majority of special education classes across Georgia are taught by underqualified teachers. The state's Department of Education knows the problem exists, but offers few incentives to better train teachers. If life is like riding a bicycle, then Levi Fincher often feels like he's spinning his wheels, not getting around the neighborhood, but his struggle to learn new words. You know, he's not as, as quick to the draw as everybody else, and things are just harder. He has to work really hard. Do you need me to read it to you? Mm -hmm. His mom, Jamie, says her son struggles with dyslexia. Mm -hmm. uh. Matt. Dyslexic kids have a lot of word finding issues. They'll use the wrong word, like say blueberries for grapes and things like that. Shag. Levi is a first grader at Kincaid Elementary in Cobb County. When he started the school year, Fincher says she learned his special education teacher didn't have specialized training in dyslexia. That tells me that what she's doing, there's probably some components that are going to be beneficial, but for these kids it needs to be very systematic, very explicit, and very repetitive. According to records obtained from the Georgia Department of Education, about a third of all special education courses taught at Kincaid Elementary last year were led by instructors teaching out of their field. What the law says is that all children, regardless of their disabilities, are entitled to what's called FAPE, Free Appropriate Public Education. So based on federal law, it is a requirement of whatever school system to provide an appropriate education to meet that child's unique needs. Is that happening in Georgia in your opinion? Mm, no. A review analysis of hundreds of schools across Georgia show the majority of special education courses are taught by underqualified teachers. From urban schools in Cobb to more rural schools like Mundy's Mill High School in Clayton County. 38% of its special education courses were taught by teachers without specialized training last year. I'm looking for... Siobhan Brown's daughter, Taylor, is a sophomore at the school, diagnosed with attention deficit disorder and anxiety. What's your reaction to those numbers? It's surprising. Um, it's hurting 
um, as the parent, knowing that my child is not receiving what we've been offered, told we would be offered, um, and it shows. Brown says teachers are supposed to follow Taylor's IEP, an individualized education plan, during classroom instruction. Taylor needs more attention and time on assignments. It's a legally binding agreement. But it's still not being done. And I can say that because she's still failing. Somebody should be working with her. Somebody should be providing those accommodations to her during those 50 minutes of your one class period. But day in, day out, it's 50, 40, 30s. So it's constant battle with the school. It's a tough job. It is a very tough job. Cindy Saxon is an associate superintendent at the Georgia Department of Education. And so today, she says the state knows it has a shortage of certified special education teachers, a problem Georgia shares with the rest of the country. It's a national problem. It's a Georgia problem. What are you guys doing about it? We are providing induction support. Um, we are working with the Professional Standards Commission on the preparation program content. We've been doing that for years. That's not anything new, but we continue to do that. There are federal programs which forgive student loans for teachers pursuing special education certification, but there are few incentives offered in Georgia. Do you think that's something the state should invest in? Um, I think that that is a fiscal question for the legislature. Um, House Bill 280 is funded by the legislature. So I can't, I'm not going to speak to telling them what to do with their money. That is always the population that's going to be left out first. And so the fact that we don't have a stipend for special education doesn't strike me as odd as, at all. Stephen Owens is a senior education policy analyst with the Georgia Budget and Policy Institute. They're working on self-sufficiency, they're working on self-esteem, that they are making sure that these students feel cared for in a school and for that reason this is a group of teachers that needs to be cared for the most and pay has to be the first step on that. Georgia's children who need help the most often facing a long road to equity in the classroom. I really think the teachers want to do what's best but they're not equipped. Andy, how are the school districts responding to this problem? You know, some of them tell us that this is a symptom of a national teacher shortage in STEM courses and especially special education. Others say the state's numbers don't paint a fair picture of their schools because some of its students attend multiple schools like tech schools. We posted all of our findings of every school in Georgia on our website. Simply go to this story on 11alive.com, pick your school district and your school and see the results yourself. Coming up on The Reveal. There were several times I thought, oh, the cavalry's coming, you know, they're coming. Did they come? No. Dogs living in deplorable conditions. Should the state do more to prevent it? The pictures are horrifying. The only thing worse would be to see the puppy mill in person. In just three months, law enforcement has rescued more than 1,200 dogs from deplorable conditions. Yeah, and it's put a strain on shelters and foster homes. But why isn't the state cracking down on these breeders before the conditions spiral out of control? The land is open, and here, Boss can run free. <laughs> Boss was the last of nearly 300 German Shepherds rescued from a dog breeder in Montgomery County. Commissioner Greg Palmer stayed on the property several nights during the rescue. He was the guard dog on the porch. But Palmer knew it was Boss that needed the protection. Uh, I mean, it was just horrible, some horrible conditions. <laughs> Months before Angela Powell, the owner of Halo German Shepherds, was arrested for cruelty to animals, concerned citizens in two counties repeatedly called animal control, law enforcement, and the Department of Agriculture to demand better care for the dogs. There were several times I thought, oh, the cavalry's coming, you know, they're coming. Did they come? No. So Clint Brady made this post on social media using pictures he says were taken from Powell's properties. So that's what it took, social media. Yeah, social media is what exploded. What that explosion prompted Ag Division Manager Mark Mura to create a list of other breeders that might need a second look. 
Two months later, 700 dogs were rescued in Berrien County. Dogs stuffed so tight in cages, several learned to sleep standing up. I think we're holding them accountable as the best we can as the rules are written. But it's those rules that are now under scrutiny. Is there anything that makes you feel like, though, this problem has been solved? No. It has not been solved. In 2017, there was a jump in the dog population at Halo. An inspector with the Department of Agriculture reported problems with drainage, causing some dogs to live in mud filled with feces. Others had no shade. In 2018, a complaint brought inspectors back. The number of dogs had more than doubled. There were now accusations of dog fighting, animals being beaten with a shovel, and dead dogs left to decompose on the ground. The animals were ultimately taken out of that situation. But again, it took more than a year from the time the problems were noted to when the animals were removed from that situation. There are periods of time in that particular case where the individual was able to care for those animals. But that is not what the department's own inspection reports say. While they do list progress, by the time she surrendered her license, Pal had nearly a dozen violations, a stop order to breed or sell, and injured animals had been documented. The Agriculture Department did appeal to local law enforcement, but to the sheriff and district attorney, the matter didn't seem urgent. They're misdemeanors. A misdemeanor is like a speeding ticket. No teeth in the law, no keen eye to the problem, and no prosecutors willing to bite. There was a civil suit. Powell's parents owned some of the land used to house the dogs, and they wanted them off. When the judge ordered Powell to downsize, Sheriff Doug Mabin and others in the community hoped the problem would simply just go away. So everyone was expecting someone else to take care of this situation. Right, right. So nobody was taking care no, of the situation. No. But Angela Powell didn't get rid of the dogs. Instead, she bought some land about 20 miles away and she started to move them. The dogs were tucked in the trees away from the road, making them difficult to see. <coughs> and in this body camera video taken during a visit to that land by the Candler County Sheriff's Office, Powell says the dogs are hard to hear. So it's just far enough away from everybody that they don't bother anybody. Right. <laughs> But these women say they could hear the dogs, and the sounds were disturbing. Being around animals, you know when so an animal is yelping in pain and barking at a squirrel. According to records, there were at least five visits to the property in Candler County by animal control or deputies. This is the only one with video that prosecutors will release. This is supposed to be a sanctuary, basically, for us and the dogs. There were no laws at the time limiting the number of animals a person could keep, and the dogs appeared to have food, water, and shelter. But as more dogs arrived, neighbors insisted something was wrong. Oh my gosh, that is mm -hmm. awful. A few snuck onto Powell's property to prove it. And they came back with pictures of um, a fresh kill. These dogs were murdering each other and eating each other. We immediately recognized that this was a case of felony animal cruelty. Was there food? Was there water? There were feeders. Were they, did they have food in them? They did not have food in them. Animal law attorney Claudine Wilkins was in Montgomery County and helped with the rescue. She says the Department of Agriculture needs the authority to continue monitoring breeders that lose their license. Remember, Powell was ordered months before her arrest to stop breeding and selling puppies. But Wilkins says she didn't. When we arrived, there were male and females inside cages, intact, allowed to breed. There were mothers with puppies, mothers that were pregnant, definitely still breeding. We tried to talk with Powell about the allegations, but she had nothing to say. He's on patrol. Commissioner Palmer hopes animal advocates, though, don't stop talking. I, I've really lost a lot of confidence in the system. But he hasn't lost confidence in Boss. Boss, I know he's happy. There's no doubt in my mind. Rebecca, the Department of Agriculture seems to be on the front line of this. What are they doing about it? They have created a position to focus on training, hoping to help local law enforcement and animal control better understand how to spot animal cruelty as well as show why it's important to prosecute these cases. Remember, the state can find breeders and shut them down, but they cannot make an arrest. We have put a number of ideas for how our state, even local communities, can better protect these animals. It's all on our website, 11alive.com. You've been watching The Reveal, a show dedicated to impact investigations. We'll see you next week for another edition of The Reveal.
Thanks for joining us.